Thank you for coming on. It's been a while oh, since we um, actually worked together. I was thinking about it uh, the other day um, in terms of where we first started. And I believe it was the first day you started with Notash, Notosh. Yeah, it was, it would, that, which yeah. is now, what's that? Four, four, eight, gosh, eight years ago? Eight, yeah. nine years ago? Yeah. Yeah. So, so wow. you, <laughs> yeah, wow. We've both we've both um, done some interesting things, I think, over the years. Yeah, yeah. and we should be very proud of that too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am. Um, I was trying to find the perfect photo for us, <laughs> and I think this one here of the pillars is a pretty good oh, yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Where, where's that from? That's um, from Thousand Stairs. So when you go to the stairs and oh, then you go yes. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. So if you go to trail, yeah. So um, tell me. Uh, in terms of your, I just, sorry, I've just been exploring. I was just saying, I was just looking at what you've done in the last uh, few years and I came across your, tree day competition is that yours oh right yeah we just well yeah. we just just announced that so that's with that's a project we're doing with uh planet arc uh mm. through uh uh the, the new role i've just started at cool australia so um planet arc have been running this for a number of years around trying to support schools to um use schools tree day which is on the 29th of july as a chance to plant trees and then as part of that work with planet arc we're actually writing a lesson um, to go along with that to support teachers. So one of my first jobs I got given at Cool Australia was to write that lesson. So it's a way to get like into how they work. So I must say, um, I don't think I've actually written a lesson for a, a while. It does remind me of, gosh, like actually a long time ago now, back when I was working mm -hmm. with Eltham College, I got some, uh, a project with, um, I was gonna say, uh, it was Ellen and Unwin doing resources and curriculum resources for Kirsty Murray's books. Um, and what it was a whole series of them she did. And so the whole act exercise of trying to get the curriculum and translate it into the classroom for, for a teacher that could be teaching it anywhere, it's always a good challenging and create a bit of fun. So that's what I've been doing the last, well, amongst many things, but in the last couple of weeks, I've been actually working on that that lesson for Planet Arc. So um, yeah, it's gonna be published very soon. And originally coming from the library system, <laughs> that all would have helped, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, look, I will always be a library geek, I think. Uh, I absolutely yeah. love libraries. I think, as I was saying, actually having coffee with someone on Friday morning, uh, actually at the State Library, and I hadn't been there for oh, quite a few years. And funnily enough, on the table next to it, us, there was a person there having coffee uh, who I knew who I'd also originally met at the library. And we both looked at mm -hmm. each other and it was this sort of weird bit of serendipity. And he said he hadn't been back there in a long time either. So by sheer chance, we both were there on a Friday morning, hadn't been there in ages and sitting opposite each other. So I always think the library is this lovely kind of magnet for the community. And, mm -hmm. and as I was saying to the person I was having coffee with, libraries are one of the last vestiges of public space where you can go and not be sold you know there's no no commitment from there you don't have to hand over your passport or your bank details you just go there and you can be immersed in some of the world's greatest knowledge and information so libraries and public libraries are very very special places and we should be protecting them at all costs you would absolutely love the library at my school it's just fabulous at lunchtime it's just full of kids in fact we actually have to close the doors about halfway through lunch um, and in you go in there and there's like a buzz feel um, uh, to, in translation in the adult world it's like going to the clubs <laughs> and meeting yeah. up with people so it's actually it yeah. fantastic so you're all about networks and um, you're passionate about learning and teaching and design thinking so thank you for coming on to uh, courageous dialogues and you've um, been courageous in, in your career especially over the last eight years do you want to talk about something that um, you know was a pivotal point for you in terms of being courageous 
Yeah, gosh, I, I um, yeah, I, look, thank you, Tanya. It's 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 a real pleasure, actually. And I think that it, it's quite a provocative thing to talk about something being really courageous because a, a lot of, I think, um, you know, a lot of elements of being brave is associated with being courageous. It means you have to be standing up against something or you have to be kind of sometimes actually going against the flow, you know, to be courageous. And I don't know, I actually sort of struggle sometimes to think about what, what would I say has been truly courageous where I've stood up for something kind of, you know, against a, a, an authority or against something that was trying to bowl me over. There's probably been many examples, but one of the ones that does come to mind that I'm very proud of actually um, just speaking actually of my time at Eltham College, and this was way back in 2001. So, so 20, <laughs> is that 20 years ago? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, and we had the opportunity to, uh, I had the opportunity to, to lead um, their year nine city campus program, which at that point was in Flinders Lane. And we had an opportunity from the principal to, kind of throw out the rule book and redesign what a year curriculum should be about and not look at the, um, well, at this day, at that stage, it was the CSF, the Curriculum and Standards Framework, if you might remember those good old days. I think mm -hmm. it might've been CSF2. Um, and we it said- It was we won't actually look at around that. that time, yeah. Yeah, we, we won't look at that. We're just gonna look at what, what do we believe. We literally kind of locked ourselves away for a week and had the most amazing debates. And in the end, um, the, the basic structure, there were two things we felt were important for, for Year Nines. The first one was independence and responsibility, still things that hold up today. And then we created the curriculum using four themes, culture, community, communication, and environment. And we found that we then looked at the CSF2 and found that we could map pretty much all of the curriculum to those four themes. And then that's how we started building that program. And so at the time as a teacher, I felt like I was kind of, you know, turning off the curriculum side of my brain. Why, you know, that shouldn't that be our starting point, but actually coming back to what we believe was important to year nines who were going to be inside the CBD for most of a year really changed us. So that whole point of context and sort of designing from the ground up a little bit. And um, yeah, I'm always really proud when I look back on that because I think we made the right move. And if I look at where education has come and actually where somewhat society has come to when, when we look at things like culture and environment, I think it was a very somewhat courageous move to be going right out there and really pushing for that over 20 years ago. Mm. So that brings me to um, you like, tricky sort of topics and you're provocative in that space tell me you know um lately how you've been provocative with education and pushing people's thinking look i think the the opportunity to start this new role uh, as general manager for cool australia has been wonderful because it gives me an opportunity to look at things with fresh eyes but also look at the way in which um, through cool's work trying to tie together social, economic, and environmental sustainability and, and marry that with curriculum resources. So coming to my point, there's an element of a little bit of full circle here mm. where designing curriculum resources, but also trying to actually um, connect that to a much more real world, um, somewhat provocative um, context for teachers and for students. So, some of the things at the moment that Cool have been um, developing are things around uh, a series called Resilient Australia, which is about supporting um, year seven and eight students in geography, particularly, but looking at um, natural disasters. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, most Australians, oh, there are, in fact, there are many, many Australians have now experienced elements of a natural disaster uh, and, and will continue to do so. So. I think the provocation for me, um, and I was actually reading some other pieces of what other conversations are happening at the moment and people trying to really shift education. I think the provocation for me now is there are seems to be a really strong groundswell of people who see there's enough here to really make education step up and be more ambitious. I think the provocation is we need to make sure that the real world context for that is closely tied to education so that education doesn't build more bubbles around itself 
And what I mean by that is obviously the, um, the future of our world somewhat without being too doomsday, but, but the future of our world in terms of environment, uh, in terms of the type of world we want to create for ourselves and for the young people that are in schools, we really need to be making sure that um, their imagination and creativity and critical thinking about where that's going is brought into the classroom. Um, and maybe we need to then let some other things, you know, move out of the way. And that's probably a provocation in of itself. Um, but I think for me, I've always been interested in how education can be more real world, whether that was when I was in the city campus, when I was trying to link it to design thinking, when I was trying to link um, most recently Australian education to our own neighborhood in, in the Asia Pacific region. I think if education is not about the real world, then it runs the risk of, um, yeah, as I said, building its own bubbles, but also building a level of redundancy into itself. And yeah, that, that, that can be where kids check out of education. Yeah. So you've said a couple of interesting things um, as we've been talking. So when you talked about um, the first initiative that you did in terms of designing that lesson plan, you looked at the curriculum is what I heard and you could see enough threads. I'm a big believer that if you want a thread, just look at the curriculum. It's not a Bible. You can play with it and um, you can connect it to the world. So you and I are very similar in terms of, you know, it's action base, it's design learning, it's connecting to the world. And that's why I love your work. But tell me, we still live in a world of NAPLAN and ATAR schools. What do you say to people that say you can't do that because we've got to teach them the content to pass that test? Yeah, look, um, I... It, the most important thing about education is about balance. And so much of the debates in education continue to be about some sort of binary between, we still want um, expectations around tests, whether that's NAPLAN or ATAR, but we also want all this other stuff as well. Or, you know, oh, the only way to teach is by direct instruction. It's, you, you have to tell the kids what to learn, what to know, what to understand, feed it back to me and I'll tell you if I'm right and I'll tell you what to do next. Or those that say it's all about inquiry and problem solving and, and developing a, a student-driven, you know, program that they then go and execute. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I just don't understand, I, I think I had this chat with someone on Twitter recently was, haven't we all forgotten about that it is about balance? You know, I, I'm not anti-test, I'm not anti-NAPLAN but it's, it's always about putting those things in context. What I don't understand is the pressure on NAPLAN when, um, and, and what children might achieve in NAPLAN when that's not the point of NAPLAN. Nap NAPLAN mm -hmm. is not my child gets this score in NAPLAN and they're the best child. That's not how NAPLAN even works. People still confuse that. And the media has a bit to cop on this for conflating NAPLAN as if it's some sort of individual test. It's simply a marker to help essentially help, um, you know, drive policy and planning both for schools and for systems in what we should be doing about, um, you know, how we look at literacy and numeracy. And those can be really valid things. It's just one data point on a certain day on that kid and doing that test. They shouldn't be revising for it. They shouldn't be preparing for it. You know, it's just, it is just a test. Um, and there are other tests where you do need to prepare and you do need to do your work for but I would argue maybe the age of tests is something that could go through its own creative regeneration. So, you know, at what point will NAPLAN um, test students about, um, you know, digital literacy, climate literacy, um, other things other, beyond just the binary of can you read, write, spell and do arithmetic? You know, I, I think we need to um, have an opportunity to, uh, use that time and space and data to maybe see are there other things that we could be trying to better understand. Uh, and the same goes then for um, the curriculum. You know, like, as you said before, it's, it's not a rule book. It is just a guidebook. And if you use it as a guidebook where you get to interpret your own meaning and contextualize it for your own context, then you can do amazing things with it. And if you are struggling then of course there are always going to be lots of resources like even the ones that you know I do with Cool Australia that actually will help you on your way 
Uh, and one of the things I said to my colleagues, um, I think it was about two or three weeks into this role, I said, what I get from seeing the work I do now with Cool Australia is very much about designing tough topics into cool learning. And, you know, to, to be a bit of a pun on that, you know, obviously it is taking a topic that otherwise would be quite hard to teach and hard for students to understand, but then trying to make it fun, engaging, real world, and, and essentially, you know, a little bit mm. less daggy or less dry than it might have been. So we need those things in balance. And if we forget that education is about balance and everything relies on getting that mark in that test or your life is over, like in an ATAR scenario, then we're absolutely missing the mark. Uh, and I did see actually, I think this morning, someone was tweeting um, that there is, and there's now a tool, I wish I might, should go and have a look for the name of it. You can give it some topics and context or a question, and it can now write an essay for you. So an AI okay. tool can generate an essay response. And one of the teachers responding said, actually, I would grade this about a B. So, so, mm -hmm like the world of what questions are we really trying to get from our learners and just getting generic responses when a computer can do that. And we know computers can now make art. Um, they can create images and, and deep fakes that we actually confuse it with reality. It's actually, I think, hope pushing us to say what really is important to them. How do you express something intimately human about your knowledge and experience? And if a test can't do that, or it can be, gamed in some way then don't blame and block all the tools and try and de-gamify it push get it to push help us to push it further like um actually while i'm thinking about it there was a lovely example there's a a university entrance exam i think it i was going to say oxford but i think it's in the uk somewhere and i think it's like two hours and all it is is a single word so I, I recall the story being, you know, the word that the, on one exam was water and you had to write about water for two hours. Now, in my experience, that's a really powerful um, mm. ex exam context because no one, like you, you can prepare for all sorts of things, but actually where do you draw on your own creative knowledge? And I know that a, a, a exam in Finland did something similar where they actually allowed students to um, completely open book exam and if they needed to email, literally like almost like millionaire, if you needed to email a friend and go, can you tell me about, you know, this point in medieval history? Cause I need this for this exam. If you had those kinds of networks to pull into that exam, great. You've built up those kinds of networks. And I think that's the other thing that I'm a big fan of is really good networks uh, and helping young people to build and reach out and grow really positive, strong networks that'll help them and their knowledge and their careers. Yeah, I think that's really important. I did not know about the art. <laughs> um, that's um, some really good points. I know that when I first take a class as students, you know, at the beginning of this year, actually, this happened. I um, was walking around the room talking to the kids about, you know, what they were going to be doing. And a kid quickly um, minimised his screen and I said, what are you doing? Can I have a look? And he's pulled it up and he said, I'm just... YouTube being, you know, the best solutions. And I'm like, so why did you minimise it? It's like, because, you know, that's cheating. And I said, no, that's actually remixing, repurposing. That's what we do in um, workplaces, you know, when we don't know how to do something or we want an idea or we want to spark an interest, that's where we go, just keep doing it. So um, the change of thinking there in the classroom is definitely required. I have mm. a statement. I'm just going to read it. What is your response to teachers don't, need to prepare for action-based learning and they can do away with learning intentions and success criteria. Whoa, good provocation. Um, hmm. I'm going to, well, if I have to have a short answer, I'm going to disagree. Um, I think as an educator, you always need to be prepared. Uh, even when you don't quite know where it's going to go. So look, if I take the context in which we met Tanya around looking and exploring design thinking, you can, you can develop really significant deep learning experiences if you understand a process of learning and I can plug almost any content into it. So, so you know, I, I, I don't need to prepare, but I bring a certain process with me I know how to run an experience to help learners discover their own knowledge and 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 come to their own solutions so 
Yeah, I still think preparation is important because we'll always have the context of learning, like where is it happening, when. Um, we'll always have some sort of curriculum that, that might need to guide us, whether it's our own or someone else's. And we'll always need to understand the learner. We'll always need to know who am I walking into a room with? Are they 12 years old and, and you know, um, sprightly and wanting to please the teacher or are they 16 and would rather say something much worse to the teacher and, and storm out? Like we, yeah, we need to be prepared. And when it comes to learning intentions and success criteria, yeah, look, I, I think there's a problem in that education might overuse that. I have been in a few schools where that's literally like glued to the whiteboard. I think anything like that, where it just becomes a like a fairly dull routine, it just, it just immediately loses its purpose. The only difference is if you circle back on it. So if you have a learning intention and you can say with the learners, well, did we get there? Um, then that's useful. And the success criteria is something that sometimes can be co-designed or, or edited. And I, I think if you lock those things in stone all the time, you might miss some of the beautiful little tangents of learning. Um, so I think they're good to guide a teacher's preparation, but I don't think they should be a hammer and nail that get you know, as if that's like your get out of jail free card. And if, as long as you have that on the whiteboard, then the teacher accepts no responsibility. I don't, well, I'm being a bit facetious there, but yeah, I, I think. It, it, <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you said that um, in terms of your response, because I, I agree you need to know. One of the things that um, I've done this semester, which is really exciting, and it's one of, one of my classes that I'm going with anticipation but um, I did up the unit plan and the assessment and the learning intentions and at the beginning of the unit I said this is what I'm thinking that we should do what do you think and um, you can have free reign you can edit it but we must go through these design processes as we go through this um, and I actually had the students actually each um, gave me their ideas, amended the documents, and then from that we created um, the assessment and unit plan. So it's actually one of the classes where you walk in and just everyone's really engaged and and because um, we're designing it together. So I'm so glad you said that. And we do have learning intentions and success criteria. I did I did ask you that purely because I know that there is some thinking out there that when people think design thinking or inquiry based or action based learning, they think it's you know no preparation, no planning. This is easy. We can play, you know, sort of thing. So that's why I asked you. Um, that. So thank you for coming on to Courageous Dialogues. And as I was looking into you earlier, I came across, I'm pretty sure you wrote this, um, it was about relationships and networks. Um, instead of just preparing kids for a world of work, how about we do better at pre preparing them for a world of networks? Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Tell me Jenny. about yeah, that. that I uh, well, I, that's that's a phrase I came up with a number of years ago. I used to say it everywhere I went, particularly when I was working um, with with Notosh, and I still believe it deeply today. I, I think we assume in the digital world that kids can develop their own networks, but I don't think that's true. So the whole sort of digital native thing, I don't think like has really got much basis to it other than kids just are happy to explore and kind of press stuff and see what happens. But to really build networks that open up your thinking and open up pathways, you need to be shown where they are. Um, you need, you need a, an educator who might understand your passions or your interests say, well, if you're connected with this person, you don't, this artist, do you know this group? Or you could email these people and you could reach out and have a chat to them. So you need someone to encourage you. And I think that can build your confidence. It can help you connect with all sorts of groups. Um, and I think in some ways they also lead to a world of work. They open up yeah. pathways. And um, that statement about having a world of networks has been just as true for me in my career and the, the ways I've moved between different roles and in different contexts of learning. I would, I would not be here today if it wasn't for my networks. Yeah. And uh, talking about networks, you remember the last time we spoke on the phone? 
That what was did I say? That, I don't know. <laughs> I was. We were having a really engaging conversation, and I hopped in the car and I reversed my car and I reversed into another car. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I hung up and I, I blame you for that <laughs> oh okay well yeah, yeah sorry my bad um, distracted you with too much provocative net, net, networking can also <laughs> do that leads to distraction yes, yes. <laughs> lots of Very shiny good. things no that's right no thank you um so I've noticed something as we're talking because I've um activated the name tag on our screens and um I've noticed what you've done there how long have you been doing that doing what you've you've actually recognized that land that you're situated on there oh well Wurundjeri country yes oh good pickup yeah I hadn't yeah. hadn't yeah so look I I think um understanding uh, and acknowledging uh First Nations um people and language and culture and countries is important it's um I, it's what makes us Australian. And mm -hmm. we've sometimes forgotten about that. And particularly this week being Reconciliation Week, um, it's an important time to remind ourselves of that. And if anything, um, uh, I have often tried to learn different languages. I, I really want to make more of an effort to learn um, languages, like what particularly it might be Wurundjeri words and phrases. And, and often I think we know they're there. And it might be the Yarra Yarra, it might be Bunjil, Birrung Ma, all these sorts of words, but actually um, understanding their purpose, their meaning, their, their, their narrative as part of um, a part of the dream time mm -hmm. um, beliefs and, and cultures and stories that have been passed down. So those things I think are really important for us to um, connect with. Uh, mm -hmm. And in my previous work, looking at, you know, sort of Australia and Asia connections, um, we talked a lot about global citizenship, but one of the most interesting things about global citizenship is that when you do connect with, let's say, people from a completely different country, you might travel there, they're often interested to know about Australia and about uh, First Nations Australians. And I often found myself a little bit at a loss for words. So in some respects, being a global citizen means also knowing yourself and where you come from and why it's important because that also makes you a good ambassador and a good a good advocate. So, um, yeah, if you can't do that, then actually, in my own personal experience as well, it makes you realise actually I've got to do better. I need to understand, connect, and and learn a bit more. <laughs>